when you're evaluating the breath to see if it's comfortable and how you can make it more comfortable. There are different ways you can do it. One way is to start with one spot in the body where you're most sensitive to how the breathing feels. This might be in the chest, might be in the throat. And stay with that one spot. And then adjust things so that one spot feels good. And then from there you spread out. Think of the sense of well-being spreading out as your awareness spreads out until finally you fill the whole body. In other cases, though, you can start with the whole body. Just try to be aware of everything from the head down to the toes. And then ask yourself, in this context, what feels good? Try to maintain that full body awareness. And you'll see that may, something that may have felt good at one spot doesn't necessarily feel good when you got the whole body. So whichever method is easier for you, you can start either way. But you're trying to get to a state of mind where your awareness is filling the whole body. And there's a sense of ease. The ease may or may not be great. But you protect what you've got, and it's in the protecting that things grow. Now the advantage of having this larger frame of awareness is that when pains come up or when pleasures come up, you're not so overwhelmed by them. The Buddha talks about how in his practice he always made sure that pains and pleasures did not invade his mind and remain. And as you begin to discover pretty quickly, it's not the case that they're invading your space, your bringing them in. So you want to make sure they don't overwhelm you. And by having this larger frame, you can see that they're actually smaller. As the Buddha says, we tend to be ignorant of the sensations in the body that are not all that intense. In other words, when there's an intense pain, it seems like everything in your mind gets absorbed into that the intensity, and everything else in the body gets blotted out. And all of a sudden you feel you've got pain all around you. That's not really the case. If you can maintain full body awareness, you can see all the pain is only in one spot. There are huge areas of the body that are not in pain. Even though there may be several pains here and there, still the majority of the body is not in pain. Now the mind is used to focusing in on the pains, or focusing in on the really intense pleasures. Because the pains it sees to itself are warning signals, and the pleasures are things it goes running after. But then the question is, do you want these things to rule your life? Think about all the things that people do out of fear of pain and desire for pleasure. See how easily they can be manipulated. I mean, you see the media doing this to people all the time. There's that New Yorker cartoon. People are walking down the street. They have little sticks coming up off their backs. Hanging down from the end of the stick is a little carrot. And then you've got a guy driving down the street with a sports carrot. And it's that little tiny thing that keeps people going. They'd like to have a sports carrot, too. But the people walking down the street, there, their backs are bent over. And they're working really hard so they can get that little hit of pleasure or run away from what they think is a pain, or the pains they anticipate. So you've got to ask yourself, do I want my mind to be pushed around by these things? As the Buddha said, you're developed in body and developed in mind. And he doesn't mean by that that you go out and exercise the body a lot, or you go out and you read a lot of books. To be developed in body and developed in mind means that you don't let pains overcome you. You don't let pleasures overcome you. And having this larger frame is very helpful. So do your best to make sure that you are aware of the whole body. And you find that it helps in other ways as well. It's one of the ways of preventing sleepiness. As the mind gets sleepy, it focuses on a little pleasure, and 
wants to lie down like a cat on a pillow, and everything just folds in on your awareness and it's gone. But you've been very careful though to think, okay, even though there's pleasure here, my head is up here, my hands are here, my feet are here, everything's right here, right here, the whole body is right here. And do your best to survey that, to make sure that you keep that in mind. Then as the pleasure builds, you don't get waylaid. Don't drift off into sleepiness. And the concentration that comes with this larger frame is the kind of concentration you can carry around with you. And there's, there is a role for one-pointedness when you really want to focus on little tiny things here or there. But you have to keep this larger frame in mind as well, because otherwise when things are totally one-pointed, there may be things hiding out in the, the blocked-out areas that you don't see. And also sometimes you don't see connections. But if you've got the larger frame, you can see, okay, something's happening over here on the left side and it's having an effect on the right side. Or something's happening, happening in the mind, it's having an impact on the body, or vice versa. And you get to see what's going on connections you wouldn't see otherwise. This is when the analogies for John and the Buddha keep saying, when there's pleasure, let the pleasure spread to fill the whole body. So the whole body is saturated with the pleasure. Where there's awareness, let the awareness fill the whole body. When the pleasure dies away, then you can have the, just the awareness. Because that's what you're after. You want a centered but broad awareness. Because that's where you see things that you didn't see before. The stillness is what allows you to follow things and detect subtle things. The continuity is what allows you to follow them. But the breadth of the awareness is what allows you to see connections you might have noticed, you might not have noticed otherwise. So in the beginning you're adjusting things. This is the activity in that analogy of the, the bathman or the bathman's apprentice. Mixing the soap powder with the water so you have a nice soap dough. That's what they used in those days. They didn't have bars of soap. They would make a kind of a dough that you would rub over your body. So it has to be mixed just right, which means you've got to use your powers of judgment as to what is just right right now for the body, what's just right for the mind. In that sense, you're kind of hovering around the breath, hovering around the body. And then as things get just right or good enough, then you allow yourself to meld into that sense of the body, so you're surrounded by it. And at this point, it's like trying to gain your balance on a bicycle. There's less talking going on less conversation. They're just gaining a sense of how you can stay balanced with the breath, without leaning to the future, without leaning to the past, just being right here. Without giving it to any desire that you want to think about this or think about that, and just be totally present right here. If there's pleasure, you allow the pleasure to be there. The rapture, you allow it to be there. When the rapture gets unpleasant, think of tuning in to another frequency. There are more subtle levels of energy going on. You can tune into those. When they talk about people having rapture problems in meditation, it's because they try to corral the energy or push in a certain direction. They push it up against something. Here you just let it dissipate out. You can go out the hands and go out the feet, go out the eyes. But otherwise, you don't have to adjust much. You don't have to think about much. Just being here, right here, aware right here in the body. You can ultimately get the mind to where the Buddha was on the night of his awakening. He was sitting here right here with his breath in his body, filling his awareness, the body filling his awareness. 
awareness filling the body. And then you try to maintain that. The question often comes up, well, once the mind gets concentrated, what do you do with it next? Well, in the beginning, the next is learning how to keep it concentrated. Because it's one area in which you'll start seeing things about the mind that you didn't notice before. The way it starts to broach a topic and hoping that other members of the mind will join in. It's kind of like a beehive. They say that a bee may come into the hive and say there's a really nice batch of flowers over there. It does this with its dance. And then other bees next to it will start picking up the rhythm of its dance, and they start dancing in unison. And ultimately you can get the whole hive dancing in unison, and then they all head off. And here it's the same with the mind. A little thought comes in and gets a little reverberation going. And ultimately you find what you thought was the body has suddenly been taken over by something else. There was a nice meditation cartoon I saw one time. This and a woman sitting very quietly, and then the word think appeared right in her forehead. And then there was another think down in her arm, and then there was another think here, think there, and ultimately it was just a big blotch of thinks. So that's what you want to avoid. You don't want these things to come in and take over. So you're trying to nip them in the bud. And that puts you in a position of control. As the Buddha said, one of the things you want to learn as a meditator is to think the thoughts you want to think and not think the thoughts you don't want to think. You want to be able to pull out or prevent the thinking. If it starts taking over, you know how to pull out. If it is just barely preventing, excuse me, but just barely beginning, then you want to prevent it. Keep maintaining this centered but broad awareness. And then you find that some thoughts come in and they have more force than others. You could ask, why do they have more force? What is it about them that it's more appealing? Watch for that. And when you're asking these questions, you're not totally implanted in your concentration, but you haven't left it. The image I like to think of is having your hand in a glove. And you can pull it out a little bit. Most of it is still in the glove, but there's part of it that's not. But in this case, this is where the analogy falls apart. You're actually watching what's going on in other parts of the mind. You pose the question, and then you watch. Because a lot of the insights are going to come with those little beginning stirrings of a thought, and the mind is tempted to think about it. And you want to see why. What's the appeal? What's the magnet? And you start seeing things about your mind that you never saw before, some of which are fascinating, some of which are kind of dismaying. But remember, we're here not to be fascinated or dismayed. We're here to find things out. Why is this? process have such power over us? Why are we overcome by our pleasures? Why are we overcome by our pains? And that's what the allure of these thoughts is. There's the hint of pleasure. Today we're talking about magical thinking, people thinking that you know, they think about central pleasures enough, the pleasures will actually come somehow. Is that it's what's going on in your mind or something else? I mean, the fascinating part is good. The fact that you're getting interested in the processes of the mind, how it puts things together, how it fools itself. You're taking this apart, not with abstract thinking. Think of a John Lee's image. You're not taking a little pick and going out just getting the little traces of gold in the rock. You've got to bring the rock in and you've got to smelt it. In other words, the smelting here is getting the mind into concentration and keeping it in concentration, and noticing the little things that will pull you out, and resisting them. 
That way, as he said, the tin will come out, the lead, the zinc, the copper, silver, gold. Things will separate out in the mind. And it's in seeing them as separate that you can begin to see exactly where the problem is. This is one of the big ironies of what you hear about the Buddha's teachings is so many times they say, well, the Buddha was teaching us about the oneness of everything. But as he himself said, it's when you see things as separate, that's when you understand them. Your awareness is one thing, the thoughts are something else. You bring them together to make them one. That's putting the rock in the smelter. But then as the rock gets heated, things come out and they separate of their own. So it's a big hunk of physical and mental phenomena we've got here. You bring them together, and it's when they're together solidly, and you make the effort to keep them that way. Then they begin to open up, separate out. And you find why it is that the mind was creating suffering for itself even though it never didn't want to. It was acting in ignorance. But you want to know exactly what it was ignorant of. We're not answering these questions with abstractions. We're answering them by seeing things in action. And the centered and broad awareness is the best place to see it.